Speaker, for her leadership in navigating this committee through the challenges of completing our work during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Madam Chair, and all the staff who have made this today possible. I also want to welcome Ranking Member Granger and all the subcommittee members who are here in person and those who are participating by secured video teleconferencing. I'm joined here in person by the Voice Chair of the Subcommittee, Ms. Pingree, as well as Mr. Kilmer, Mr. Simpson, Mr. Amade. Joining us, uh, participating by video, is Mr. Serrano, Ms. Watson Coleman, and Ms. Lawrence. Before I give my opening statement, I'm going to offer a brief explanation as to how this markup will work. Today's room has been configured to maintain the recommended six-foot social distancing between members and staff and members of press in the room. Some members have opted to use secure video teleconferencing, which allows them to participate remotely. For those of you on the video conference, once you start speaking, there will be a slight delay before you're displayed on the main screen. Speaking into the microphone activates the camera, displaying you on the main screen. Do not stop your remarks if you do not immediately see the screen switch. If the screen shot does not change after several seconds, please make sure you are not muted. Your voice activates the camera. To minimize background noise and ensure the correct speaker is being displayed, we ask that members who are participating by video remain on mute unless you have sought recognition. You will also notice a clock on the bottom of your screen that will show how much time is remaining. And for all of us, this is a reminder, you'll be shown one minute remaining, the clock will turn yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time has almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red, and then I will move to recognize other members. In terms of speaking order, we will follow our traditional order at the beginning with the chair and the ranking member of the subcommittee, the chair and ranking member of the full committee, and any other members who wish to speak. Finally, we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups, including documents to be inserted in the record by unanimous consent, amendments, motions, and other unanimous consent requests, and so on. That email address has been provided to your staff. I would remind all members that they must verbally request unanimous consent out loud, separately from sending the document or written UC request to the email address. So if you have something you want to enter for the record, unanimous request, you must be recognized. I want to thank you all for your patience and your understanding as we navigate this new technology and platform. And now I would like to move to my opening statement. For fiscal year 2021, the subcommittee is recommending a total of 300, excuse me, $37.8 billion in discretionary funding. That's $37.8 billion in discretionary funding. That's an increase of $771 million over last year's enacted level. In addition to our regular appropriations, the bill includes $2.4 billion in fire cap adjusted funds for suppression operations. This brings the total funding for wildland fire management to $5.7 billion. It also includes an additional $15 billion in emergency designated infrastructure investments for the Bureau of Indian Education, Indian Health Services, the Environmental Protection Agency. These investments will increase access to quality health care and education, help clean up contaminated lands, polluted water, and unhealthy air. Additionally, as a result of the impending enactment of the Great American Outdoors Act in fiscal year 2021, the Land and Water Conservation Fund will be fully funded at $900 million. This is the first time that this has happened in 40 years. This bill allocates the dis distribution of those funds once the committee receives the projects list from the agencies, which are required by the act. We will reflect the final decision in the enacted bill, and information will be available to everyone. Last year, House Democrats secured significant new investments in environmental protections and land conservation. For fiscal year 2021, this bill builds upon those successes, 
to advance the priorities of American families, ensuring we have clean air and water to protect our children's health, protecting our most special places and endangered species, and taking meaningful action to address climate change. This bill is a rejection of the dangerous policies and funding cuts proposed by the Trump administration. Instead, this bill moves us forward by investing in our resources in ways that keep our communities safe and healthy. This bill invests in the protection and preservation of our landscapes and biodiversity. Specifically, we're providing funding for advanced science to ensure it remains the foundation of management decisions, including an increase of $22 million for the U.S. Geological Survey. This bill provides $8 million for an increase for Fish and Wildlife Service International Affairs, a pro program and the Multi-International Species Conservation Fund to save iconic species and to protect them from wildlife trafficking and poaching. The Forest Service is increased by $134 million to improve forest health, protect critical watershed, address the impacts of pests like the emerald ash borer, and reduce the risk of wildland fire. Combating illegal logging and protecting our country from invasive species and zoonic diseases. The Environmental Protection Agency is increased by $318 million to help ensure that all Americans have equal access to clean air and water. This includes $34 million increase for clean air programs, $68 million for place-based water projects, $45 million for geographic programs, $13 million in additional funding to support rules that regulate PFAS chemicals, and $45 million in additional funds to enforce our nation's environmental laws. The EPA's emergency infrastructure investments include $1.35 million, excuse me, $1.35 billion for Superfund and Brownfields cleanup, $10.2 billion for clean water and safe drinking state water revolving funds, $950 million for targeted water infrastructure grants, and $450 million for DARA program. The President's budget included the elimination of the National Endowments for the Arts and the Humanities. Instead, this bill provides an increase of $7.75 million to each endowment. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected our entire nation, but there are pronounced racial disparities in its impact with African Americans, Hispanic and Latinos, and Native Americans experiencing higher rates of infection and death. While our work to provide COVID-19 relief is ongoing, this bill continues to invest in the health and safety and welfare of Indian country. The bill provides $3.5 billion for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Indian Education, and the Office of Special Trustee, and $6.5 billion to the Indian Health Service. The bill provides $28 million to increase tribal operation of Indian schools, including investment in tribal education departments to strengthen tribal sovereignty. It also includes $500 million in emergency funding for school construction. An additional $35 million is included to provide mental health and alcohol substance abuse treatment to combat the negative impacts the pandemic is having on tribal cultural practices. It also includes $1.5 billion in emergency funding to address the health care infrastructure needs. We have more work to do to ensure that we provide for the health and safety of our Native American brothers and sisters, but this bill is a step in the right direction to upholding the federal government's trust and treaty obligations. This bill also contains $102 million to address the severe problem of wild horse and burrow overpopulation in our western rangelands. And I want to thank our western colleagues for keeping the committee focused on this work, Mr. Amade and Mr. Stewart. The ranking member and I are committed to addressing this problem and we look forward to working with the administration to see what the proposed plan in its final stages will look like. I want to note that this bill contains the provisions to protect our environment for now and for future generations, given the circumstances we find ourselves with COVID-19 and the fact that many of these provisions passed overwhelmingly with support on the floor last year, I have decided to include them in the bill because we know they would be included in the bill. Provisions to block oil and gas drilling off the coast of states like Florida, California, and Maine. 
provisions to protect the pristine wilderness of the Alaska Wildlife Refuge and the Tongass National Forest, provisions to end the insurance of permits to permit sports hunted trophies such as elephants and lions from Tanzania, Zimbabwe, or Zambia, and a provision to prohibit a mine plan within the Rainy River watershed of the Superior National Forest. Finally, each of us is aware that COVID-19 is ravaging our country, taking a huge physical and emotional and economic toll on our society. The effects of this pandemic will touch the lives of every single American. The federal government has a solemn duty to provide relief and to help with the American people recover. In the absence of presidential leadership, it only increases the need for Congress to act deliberately and with dispatch. So I hope that our Senate brothers and sisters with the leadership under the Republican Party will work with us to provide our fellow Americans the help they need swiftly. And before I conclude, I do want to address one last issue, Confederate flags. The memorials have long been a symbol of oppression and discrimination in our nation. It was my first year as ranking member of the subcommittee that this bill was brought down by a Confederate flag issue. Now, five years later as chair, I continue to be greatly saddened and at times outraged that we as a nation have not made more progress to address racism and the cruel legacy of the Confederacy. And I'm committed to do everything I can to help our country confront and heal this legacy of racial injustice. And that's why I'm including in this bill language to require the National Park Service to remove all Confederate commemorative works. Furthermore, the bill includes language authored by Representative Jeffries that prohibits funds for the purchase and display of Confederate flag in our national parks with the exception, with the exception of circumstances where flags flown provide historical content. I thank Mr. Jeffries for his contributions. He has been a tremendous leader on these issues. This is not about erasing our history or denying anyone's heritage. This is about whether we're willing to do the hard work needed to confront the truth of our history and to work to right past wrongs. In order to do that, it means ending the use of Confederate symbols which continue to be used today to intimidate and terrorize millions of our American citizens. I hope that every member of this subcommittee and this body will join me. Now I turn to my colleague, the ranking member from Ohio, for any opening remarks he would like to make. Mr. Joyce. Thank you, Madam Chair, and congratulations on reaching this important milestone in fiscal year 2021 cycle for the Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies Appropriations Bill. First, I want to thank you and your staff for making a genuine effort to accommodate Republican requests in this bill. Many of these requests are bipartisan priorities. Others address matters back home in our home districts and will be appreciated by our constituents regardless of party, so thank you. I also want to thank you for the thoughtful and judicious way you've led the subcommittee during this unprecedented year. You've held more than a dozen budget hearings and COVID-19 briefings to address the new and unique challenges caused by this deadly virus, which is something all members of the subcommittee are grateful for, no matter which side of the aisle we sit on. Under these difficult circumstances, you've continued to show that even when we disagree, we can do so without being disagreeable. Perhaps nowhere do we agree more than on conservation and restoration of the Great Lakes, the largest surface, water, surface fresh water system in the world. Once again, I'm very grateful for the work you've done in this bill to support the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Continued robust investment in the GLRI is essential to reducing harmful algal blooms, eradicating Asian carp, and addressing coastline erosion. Another area where we strongly agree is Indian country. It is a testament to you and the rest of the members on this subcommittee that we continue our nonpartisan approach to programs for American Indians and Alaska Natives, which constitute more than one quarter of the bill. Especially in this year when, on a per capita basis, COVID-19 has hit Indian country harder than any other area in our nation. As a co-chair of the Bipartisan Task Force to End Sexual Violence, I was pleased to see the recommendation includes $3 million to implement the Violence Against Women Act in Indian Country and an additional $3.02 million to support the Operation Lady Justice Initiative established by the President 
to address missing and murdered indigenous people, violence against women, human trafficking, and other violent crimes. I'm grateful that even in this hyperpartisan environment that Congress often finds itself in, and this subcommittee continue to work together on behalf of Indian country. I also appreciate, especially for our Western members, that the bill provides full funding for the payment in lieu of taxes program and continues to include significant funding for wildfire suppression and hazardous fuels activity. Given this could be an especially challenging, uh, challenging wildland fire year, these funds are critical to protecting the communities across the country and preventing the devastation we have seen in recent years. However, while I applaud these bipartisan priorities, there are several problems with this bill that our side will need to address before this bill can become law. First and foremost, the bill adds several new controversial policy riders, administrative provisions, and report language directives. These partisan provisions are aimed at stopping the administration's efforts to reduce regulatory red tape and curbing energy development. While this bill makes positive strides towards renewable energy development, it takes a step back on conventional energy. One of the many lessons we have learned from COVID-19 pandemic is that we cannot rely on other countries for critical resources. Now more than ever, America needs both renewable and conventional energy, and we need to be producing it at home rather than overseas. We cannot protect American jobs if we cannot power them, and renewable energy is still not ready to carry the load on its own. There are also a number of important bill language provisions that we've agreed to in conference for the past several years that have fallen out of this draft. Adding those items back in will be essential to reaching a bipartisan agreement. A final area of concern is the funding level proposed in this bill. This bill benefits uh, from off-budget emergency funding provided in other bills. Instead of using the savings from assumed passage of the Great American Outdoors Act towards paying down our ever-growing national debt, the bill reallocates those funds. And the bill includes a new title with $15 billion in so-called emergency spending for additional infrastructure. No doubt there are infrastructure programs in this bill that need these funds and more, but that alone does not give the federal government license to continue to borrow and spend without any overarching plan for fiscal responsibility. It is for a combination of these policy and funding reasons that I cannot support this bill at this time and in its current form. But I'm committed to continuing to work with you, Madam Chair, and the rest of our colleagues on the subcommittee as we move through fiscal year 21 process to craft an interior bill that can receive bipartisan support, can keep the government operating, and can help conserve our nation's natural, cultural, and environmental resources that we all care so deeply about. I yield back. Thank you for your remarks, Mr. Joyce. Now I'm pleased to yield to our full, full committee chairwoman for her opening remarks. Ms. Lowy, before you're recognized, I know there are many accolades going out as this is your last interior subcommittee markup. I wanna thank you for the mentorship and leadership you have displayed with me both before I was a member of appropriations and now as a chair of an appropriations subcommittee. Ms. Lowy, you are recognized. And I thank Chair McCullum and Ranking Member Joyce for your work on this bill, as well as the staff for your efforts to review member requests and craft the product before us. And I thank you, Madam Chair, for your very kind words. It's been a pleasure working with you. The fiscal year 2021 Interior Appropriations Bill would fulfill its obligations to make sound investments to preserve our natural resources protect Americans from environmental hazards, and meet the challenges of the climate crisis by investing $9.37 billion, an increase of $318 million for EPA, including an increase of $13 million for Superfund, $3.2 billion, an increase of $55 million for the National Park Service, and $170 million for both the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. EPA's geographic programs serve to protect the health of the American public as well as our most important ecosystems, which enables both enhanced recreational and business opportunities. When I first came to Congress, I promised to clean up the Long Island Sound. I'm proud to have secured record levels of funding to rehabilitate this precious resource in the Lower Hudson Valley, including 30.4 million in this bill today for the Long Island Sound Regional Program. I look forward to moving this bill through the appropriations process, and I yield back. Thank you.
thank the gentlewoman for her remarks. And now uh, I'd like to yield to the ranking member, Ms. Granger, for her opening remarks. But Ms. Granger, what an opportunity in my lifetime to have um, both you and Ms. Lowy, both as chairs and ranking members of such an important committee to our country. It speaks well of we've come a long way, but we have more way to, ways to go. Ms. Granger. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair McCollum, and for presenting the fiscal year 2021 Interior Environment and Related Agencies Appropriations Bill today. I also want to thank Ranking Member Mr. Joyce for his leadership on the subcommittee. I appreciate the work you've done on many important programs supported by the Interior Bill. This bill funds priorities and concerns of members on both sides of the aisle and does many good things for the preservation of our natural resources. For example, the bill prioritizes funding to maintain our national parks and support efforts to stop the trafficking of endangered species. In addition, the bill helps local communities across the country with education and safety needs, particularly in Indian country. Even though the bill funds many shared priorities, there are several policy issues that raise concern. The bill eliminates several long-standing common sense provisions that have had bipartisan support for many years. Instead, the bill adds many new poison pill riders and directives that would limit domestic energy and mineral production and prevent the administration from reducing regulatory burdens. Just as in previous years, we can expect the administration to oppose these and other controversy, controversial policy riders. We will have to address them as this bill moves forward so it can eventually, can eventually be signed into law. Additionally, I'm concerned about spending across all the fiscal year 2021 appropriations bills, and in particular, the funding levels proposed in this bill. The bill includes $15 billion in new emergency spending, including components of the infrastructure bill that was pushed through the House last week without Republican involvement. I do not support that bill because it was a departure from years of bipartisan work on infrastructure priorities, and I can't support this additional spending today. We must find ways to rein in federal spending while addressing our nation's most pressing needs. I look forward to resolving these policy and funding differences as we move the, the, through the appropriations process. In closing, I want to recognize all the subcommittee members for their dedication to the important programs in this bill. I also want to thank my staff, Kristen Clarkson and Darren Benjamin, as well as the majority staff. I thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady for her remarks. I know there are two other members wishing to speak, so I will recognize them in, in, in the order uh, of seniority. And then if others wish to speak, please remember after uh, Ms. Lawrence has spoken to um, unmute your microphone. Ms. Pingree, you are now recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I just wanted to mention a few things. You've already done a great job of comprehensively, comprehensively explaining to everyone uh, the important issues that are covered in this bill and the important funding areas. But I do want to thank you for your hard work and your staff um, for doing such a wonderful job and uh, to the ranking member for working alongside all of us as well. Uh, just a couple of things I wanted to bring up. Uh, I'm so pleased to see the $170 million for both the NEA and the NEH. Um, f this goes to our uh, important cultural and arts sector, and I think it's often maligned and un misunderstood, but the fact is um, this is one area of our economy that has been extremely hard hit with the coronavirus. Uh, it goes from Broadway down to the smallest community theater. If you think about it, almost everything in this sector has to be done in front of people in a crowded room, and it means that everyone from the backstage to the front of the stage has been shut down and out of work, and it's been a very critical time, and uh, it's often misunderstood the incredible impact this has, even in small rural states like mine. Pleased to see continued investments in Indian country, particularly Indian Health Service. We know that this is yet one more community that has uh, really been disproportionately affected by COVID, and uh, we need to continue to do more. Um, I'm also glad to see that there is new funding and research on the relationship between the coronavirus and air pollution. Um, once again, we have to better understand this disease and also how it impacts communities of colors and those in disadvantaged communities where um, issues with lung disease and asthma is already very present. I'm really pleased to see that the bill continues to reverse past cuts to the EPA. These are so critically important, clean air, clean water, environmental justice, PFAS. Um, 
I am so pleased, and it's critically important to the state of Maine, that this bill prohibits funds to be used for offshore oil and gas leasing or exploration. Um, that, that has the potential to critically damage our fishing industry, so we care about that very much. Also working on the National Park Service backlog, we know that's been uh, the maintenance backlog has needed to be addressed for so long. That's very important. Um, and uh, I, I just really appreciate the commitment you've made to infrastructure, climate change, preserving and protecting our club, public lands, clean air, clean water. Um, you are doing, we are as a committee doing so much in this bill and I'm, I'm really proud to support it. So thank you, I yield back and uh, thank you again for your work. I thank the gentlewoman for her remarks and you're right, we, we do it together. Um, Ms. Lawrence, have you unmuted? Yes, I have. I wanna begin by thanking uh, Chairwoman McCullen and Ranking Member Joyce and the staff of the subcommittee for your hard work you put into drafting this fiscal year 2021 funding bill before us today. I am thrilled to see that the bill and report includes many priorities <clears throat> that are so important to my district in the great state of Michigan. This bill delivers robust funding for critical programs, protects our public lands and safeguards our environmental health. Representing the great Lake State. I am thrilled to see the subcommittee prioritizing funding for safe, clean, and affordable drinking water, as well as funding for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. I also want to applaud the subcommittee for including language that will hold the administration accountable for slowing down the removal of dangerous lead lines in our communities as part of their lead and copper rule revision. This bill also strengthens protections of some of our nation's most critical ecosystems and commits to eliminating dangerous pollutants and contaminants in our community and our schools. I want to restate my thanks to the chairwoman for your great work. I want to say a happy belated birthday to you and uh, just so great to, to, to really treasure every moment that we have with you. I look forward to advancing this measure out of the subcommittee and supporting it in full committee and on the House floor. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentlewoman for her remarks. Any other member wishing to make remarks at this time? Did we miss your birthday? <laughs> Mr. Joyce is worried about my birthday. I'm 66 and still full of tricks. How's that? No. <laughs> oh. um, are there any amendments to the bill? Hearing none, I want to thank our wonderful staff, both majority and minority, for, on the subcommittee and our personal offices for our their hard work on this bill. Without you, we wouldn't be here today uh, with such a great bill. I would now like to recognize Ms. Pingree, the vice chair of the subcommittee, for a motion. I move that the bill be favorably reported to the full committee. All those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Aye. No. The ayes have it. The motion is approved. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be permitted to make technical and conforming changes to the measure just approved. Without objection, so ordered. A bit of housekeeping. For those of you who uh, received the bill in paper, please make sure that you leave those materials on the table. And with that, I thank everyone for attending both virtually and in person, and the subcommittee now stands adjourned. <laughs>